their laws and bring in a bunch of guns. But, you know, on an individual basis, if you cannot get robbed, go right ahead. Anybody else? Do you have another one? Oh, I just wanted to make a definition of long term compliance for taxes. And a, a little while ago, I was doing my homework on the IRS, and I found this on the web that I didn't want to share with everyone. This is from the IRS's website itself for their uh, criminal investigation, basically, like why they investigate it. It says compliance with the tax laws in the United States relies heavily on self assessments of what taxes are owed. This is called voluntary compliance. When individuals and corporations make deliberate decisions to not comply with the law, they face the possibility of a civil audit or criminal investigation which could result in prosecution and possible bail costs. Publicity of these convictions provides a deterrent effect that enhances voluntary compliance. Right. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me, let me summarize what he said. He was reading from a, a publication about the, the IRS Criminal Investigation Division that talks about voluntary compliance. And basically what they say is, it's it's voluntary. It's a self-assessed tax, and if you don't, we hunt you down. But that makes voluntary compliance work. So it's just yeah, it's bogus propaganda. And they do that. They do that with a lot of things. I mean, the entire notion of consent of the government is you agree to this, and voluntary compliance is the way the IRS uses the term. It's sort of the same thing, where they pretend it's voluntary, but then they'll come right out and say, and if you don't volunteer, then we come get you. So it's just, it's their semi-silly terminology, and they have to use silly terminology for everything they do, because if they ever came out and honestly described what they were doing, everybody would recognize it. Instead, they say, for the common good, we enforce the laws of the land which require everyone to pay their fair share. What they mean is, give us your money or we'll hurt you. But if they came out and said, give us your money or we'll hurt you, without the dog and pony show ahead of time, 200 million people would say no. So they do the show and they use the propaganda, and most people feel a moral obligation to give money to the most crooked organization in the world. Um, I'm not going to say that I support the state as it is now, but I haven't made that leap away from status yet, personally. As far as uh, preservation of life, like anything that you can do to stop the guy from carjacking you, including killing him, or if there's a mob and you're forced to kill someone to defend yourself. The current government, of course, has a death penalty. But if they didn't, if, if that was abolished, would that be maybe uh, an alternative where they do have a uh, monopoly on violence, perhaps, but at least they're preserving life? Wouldn't that be maybe a, a justification for the state? Uh, no, and here's why. <laughs> uh, the, question, the question had to do with um, the the death penalty and government using the death penalty and the, the, the idea of defensive violence being used, or defensive force, some people assume violence means initiation, defensive force being to protect yourself. If there's a carjacker who's saying, give me your car or I'll kill you, you have the right to use deadly force to stop him. Um, and since the state occasionally uses the death penalty to kill people, um, and that theoretically defends other people from them, isn't, doesn't that make it legitimate? I hope I got your question. So I, right. um, I, I, I think that penalty is inexcusable. If that were abolished, if the government didn't use the death penalty, but they still used violent means to, to protect life, would that be a, a justification for... Okay, that, that actually brings up two things. Um, he asked about if there wasn't a death penalty, but they used force, um, to to protect life, would that be legitimate? Using force defensively to protect life is always legitimate. Calling it government law has no bearing whatsoever on whether it's legitimate. It has no bearing on who has the right to do it. However, I would say that a government that doesn't have the death penalty for every law they write isn't a government anymore. Because if you stand up and resist, and they say, give us your property, and you say no, and they say, get out, and you say no, and they say, we're coming in, and you say, I have a gun, they will always resort to killing you if that's what they have to do to get their way. Now they'll probably just taser you and throw in gas and knock you out and drag you out physically. But ultimately, if there is any point at which government ever says, okay, never mind, just kidding, we'll leave, that's the end of it. 
And lots of people have learned the hard way that everything government does is backed by the threat, by the ability and willingness to use deadly force. Now, I do believe that deadly force is justified in protecting life. Um, I don't think whether something is government or law has anything to do with whether that's moral or not. And the only reason, basically, defensive force doesn't require a law, it doesn't require any special authority, it doesn't require government, it's inherently justified. The only thing that requires government and authority or the belief in it is the initiation of violence. Because inherent, an inherently justified force, we all have the right to do anything. If somebody has extra force, the right to use other force in situations where we don't, it's because they somehow got the right to initiate violence. So the only thing the myth of government adds is the initiation of violence against innocents, just by the nature of what government is. Um, essentially, parts about that. Uh, if there's any other questions, Go ahead, nobody's waving wild or something. Oh, he's waving wild. What was the title of your book again? Um, this one is The Most Dangerous Superstition. Um, it's the most recent one, it's the most important thing I've ever written. Um, I would say it's the most recent one, but I also started it 15 years ago. Um, I intentionally didn't finish it until I thought I could do um, the best I could do because it it basically digs all the way underneath the paradigm and tries to rip it out by the roots. And, um, my favorite thing that people say about this book is, I had trouble reading it. I would read 10 pages and I'd have to put it down and think about it for a week. It's not because the words are big, because they're not. It's not because the concepts are complicated, they're not. It's because it goes to the paradigm and rips it out. And they and I love that people say, I had to put it down and think about it and let it rattle around inside my head. And I read 20 more pages and I had to put it down again and let it rattle around inside my head. Um, there's, I'd love to hear that because it means it put that seed in there and they're daring to think about it. And that's the thing is we can't make anybody think about something, but we can give them the opportunity. We can put it in front of them and say, you really might want to consider this, especially if you like being like a moral person and you don't like bludgeon and mayhem, then think about this because you might be accidentally advocating all that nasty stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of this book and it's the least fun, least easy read of anything I've ever written. And that's the best thing about it. Here's the thing, there, there are lots and lots of people out there who have a, who are saying, if you do this trick inside the system, they'll leave you alone. And I think a lot of them are actually true as long as not too many people do it. Like, if they get a whole lot of people filing this or that paperwork, and they look at them and say, there's only a hundred of them, and they're a pain in the neck, and they're going to drag us into court, and we're going to have to spend $5,000 on each stupid court case just to do this, never mind. I think the attitude of the tyrants is, we'll let them go. If everyone does it, they say, nope, now we're going in and stomping on them. Um, that was true of the issue I raised. For years and years, they didn't prosecute anybody. They didn't want to meet with anybody. I have IRS internal memos that say, if somebody brings up this issue, do not meet with them. I know you're required to give them an examination meeting. Don't. Leave them alone. They didn't prosecute anybody until I asked them to prosecute me for many years because I wanted to be their guinea pig because I knew they didn't have a response. But what it comes down to is ultimately they don't care about their own rules. There may be a trick here and there inside their system that will keep them from robbing somebody for a while or somebody maybe forever. But when it gets big enough, they will do anything to preserve their power. And in my case, they lied and cheated all over the place. And, you know, that is not at all unique. In every tax case I know of, the government absolutely lied and cheated about everything to make sure that the slave who ran off the plantation was put in a cage, no matter what. And they have lost a few, um, even after lying and cheating all over the place. Um, but I think any solution inside the system can't be a permanent solution overall. Um, it might save one or two or a hundred people who are enough of a pain in the neck that the extortionists say, let's go find somebody easier to rob. 
but ultimately it can't bring down the monster. And that's what I want. No more monster. No more monster. <laughs> Well, I do. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. He, he asked, um, since I just sort of blurt right out the main point, do I ever tailor my message uh, based on who the audience is? And I do. I get to the point, I, I often get to the point describing it in different ways and coming at it from a different direction. And um, so, because some people, you know, I figure this crowd, enough enough of this crowd already has questioned statism, um, even, the ones, even the ones who haven't given it up, you can say government is illegitimate and their head doesn't explode, they don't jump out a window. So I can skip a lot with this crowd, even the ones who are still statists, because they dare to think about it and talk about it. A lot of people literally don't dare to think about it and talk about it. They completely freak out. There would be chaos and mayhem if Congress wasn't stealing $2 trillion a year from us. Okay. Um, but I'm pretty blunt no matter who I'm talking to. Um, and actually, I find that my, my intention is basically get to the point where they get offended, but substantially, as fast as possible. Because when I get to the point where they go, how can you think such a thing? Basically, I think I've done all the good I can do. Because their brain will shut down and they'll, they'll have conniption bits. And then three years later, they'll say, you're right. <laughs> and I don't want to brag. Okay, I do want to brag. Um, <laughs> but the happiest thing I can say is there are hundreds of people now who um, tell me that I helped them get to anarchism. And nobody can be pushed there, but they can be invited there and they can be shown the path. And a lot of individuals will run screaming the other way and thinking people will go, Really? And when they get to really, I usually just say, okay, well, you're going to go there. Now that you dare to think about it, I don't know anybody who's thought about it for years and years who didn't end up there. It's the indoctrination that holds people back. Once they let go and consider it, they'll wander down the paths and get to the point of, yeah, it's not ever okay to rob people. <laughs> I just want to say, I'm one of the people that you helped get there. Well, thank you. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for that. And I attended some of your trial, and I learned an awful lot. I mean, I know what you went through was miserable and horrible, and you're a crash test dummy for freedom. Seriously, you took the hits to help make the rest of us safer. Um, and, I, you know, my my perspective on the entire judicial system changed when I saw that this wasn't a, a quest for the truth. This was a quest to keep the jury from knowing the truth. Mm -hmm. And nothing was more obvious than that during your trial. Yeah. And I just want to encourage anybody, everybody, to take the opportunity to sit in on a court case. Hopefully not as the defendant. <laughs> just witness it. Learn firsthand because you can hear about it, but until you see it, it's not that real. So yeah. I just wanted to thank you for going through that ordeal to help people like me, uh, you know, learn those things. So thank you. You're welcome. The, my book about the whole ridiculous thing, which is out of print because it's so huge, it's too expensive to print. Um, I hope to have an ebook soon and make it for like a dollar or two, um, because that's literally I cannot read the whole thing. Like I have to take breaks or I just get too infuriated. And I've heard lots of other people who weren't even there and didn't even know me reading through it and say, I can't believe this happened. This was a giant string, absolutely ridiculous events that exposed the beast for what it is. And that's what I was hoping to do. I was hoping for a happy ending. But they had to lie and cheat and steal, and so I publicized it. Um, but yeah, there, it, unfortunately, it wasn't at all unique that the state will do whatever it has to to stop any sheep to get out of line. Um, and there are lots and lots of court cases you could attend or read about that 
that demonstrate that the state is not a protector, it's not there to keep the peace, it's not there to make us civilized, it's a giant parasite. It's a 300 pound leech stuck to a cow telling the cow, I'm why you're alive. That's Congress. <laughs> The question is, which I've, I've heard a lot, is, is, a, is the belief in authority entirely learned or is it sort of built into us? Um, I think it's a bunch of each. However, I think a lot more of it is learned than most people would would assume, because people say, well, you look around, and people tend to follow a leader, and they, you know, even if it's not an authority, they tend to, like, follow some guru, follow this guy, follow that guy. Um, so there does seem to be a lot of, of sort of built-in wiring in us that makes us into these pack animals that looks around for the alpha male and follows it around, um, which I think we're, we're slowly overcoming. But I think the, the depth to which the indoctrination goes the intentional calculated doctrine, indoctrination is hugely underestimated. And that's why I encourage anybody to look up the, uh, the experiments that Stanley Milgram did, because it is fascinating to watch people. Basically, in this study, the people didn't know what, what the purpose of the study was. They're told to harm an innocent stranger. They're told it's a test about memory and stuff. So they're pressing the button, and it zaps the other guy. That's all they know. And what the study shows is people totally know it's wrong to do that, but they will do it anyway if an authority tells them to. Even if the authority is not threatening to punish them. There is no, I'm going to hurt you if you don't hurt him. It's just an authority figure saying, press the button. Most Americans will do that to a point where the other person is either screaming in pain or goes silent as if they passed out or died. Most Americans will do that to complete strangers, and to, I, what I love about the Stanley Gilbert's book, which is, oddly enough, called Obedience to Authority, is that he goes through a bunch of different, uh, different versions of the test, but he looks at their behavior, too, and a lot of people are there shaking and sweating and saying, do I have to go on? And all the authority figure has to do is say, yep, we must go on. Okay, meaning they know it's wrong and they do it anyway. And that shows we don't have to fear the average, you know, morality, moral code of the average individual. They know it's wrong. We have to fear people who believe in authority because they do it anyway. Because their belief in authority overrides their belief in morality. And they'll scream and cry and literally beg to be allowed to stop. But if authority says you do it, they do it. Most people do it. Most men, most women. Age doesn't matter, sex doesn't matter, income doesn't matter, education matter, doesn't matter. Most Americans will cause severe pain or death to a complete stranger if a perceived authority tells them to. That is why it's the most dangerous superstition. Whenever I have a question, you can What? The online people are questioning. Oh. Want me to read it? Yeah, because I can't see it. Larkin, could you comment? Jim censored them. Something about scared of being hit. I might be able to guess. To the left of the name, is there a scroll bar? Is Close over your head. Um, I, there we go. I think I can sort of guess what the question is by what I saw. Could you comment on practical means for the enlightened to, process, to proceed? Right, right. Side set for the same. Okay. Tripping over the curtain a second. Um, yeah, the question is the, the comment on the, the basically those of us who have given up statism and the belief in authority, what do we do? What do we do to try to achieve freedom in a world where most people um, still worship the state? Okay. Um, I would say. The first thing is try to get them to not worship the state, because the more of us there are, the easier it gets. Um, but after that, basically, we, well, I'd say we, but there are, there are a bunch of different levels of we. There's a lot of people in the freedom movement who haven't all the way given it up. And if you say, 
um, hey, I'll mow your lawn if you will pay me under the table. They say, well, I'm not sure. Now, if they say I'm not sure because they're afraid of getting caught and hurt, that makes perfect sense. Just like I don't want to drive through the part of town where somebody's going to steal my car. But if they say I'm not sure because they still feel a moral obligation to bow to the state and obey it, then there's a problem. If those of us who understand that we own ourselves basically know how to find each other and make a network and say, all right, we can recognize the other people that don't worship the state and make little networks of, you know, trade and commerce and communication and, and all sorts of stuff. Sort of like an iron web. <laughs> There's a book about that. Um, but it's always a challenge because the thugs have lots of mercenaries who think they're doing the right thing as they initiate violence against people who are just trying to interact with each other voluntarily. Like that's a huge sin. Pardon me for asking a personal question, but I was wondering what your plans are for the future. I'm not talking about going to Las Vegas in a couple weeks. I mean, a couple years out. What do you, what do you see coming? Oh, uh, the end of the U.S. Empire, which will be fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think it's going to be pretty ugly because so many people worship the thing that's falling on top of them. And like in the Soviet Union, mostly what they thought was, who do we put in power? Who do we put in power? If that's the mentality, then it's going to be a very long, ugly road. I mean, Lark. In the meantime, okay, asking what I'm going to do, um, I want to stay here. I don't want to abandon the country. Um, and I want to find ways to interact with people who actually know they own themselves. And actually, I think those people are going to do just fine. Um, a lot of things will get inconvenient as the economy falls apart, but those people aren't going to starve. They're going to. Because they don't have the mentality of, oh my gosh, who's going to feed us? It's, okay, let's feed ourselves and watch out for the stupid parasites who try to stop us. Um, so I think it's going to get interesting and nasty, but I think ultimately the, the, the network, basically the black market will take over the entire economy as the white market just does a nosedive. Um, and then we'll be like Soviet Union, and then, well, that's their whole economy. And other people might actually start to think about, um, yeah, maybe giving half of our money to this giant parasite isn't really helping us out out of starving. So it may actually push people into thinking about it. Um, I, can, I plan on sticking around, um, but we have a couple escape routes if things get really bad around Philly. Um, but I think just knowing a few people who understand freedom will be key to surviving the upcoming mess. I guess, quick follow up question. When are you going to join Toastmasters? <laughs> <laughs> Who asks me that every time? I know. One answer. Asking me when I'll join Toastmasters. I don't know. <laughs> That's so my I'm not opposed to it. I just feel <laughs> completely <laughs> overwhelmed by it. You're a great speaker, Lark, and we can learn a lot from you. We can have a few edges that can be sanded down. What she do is threaten me with violence oh, and make oh, me. Oh, 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 <laughs> Except I don't drink, so. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, whenever I find myself like interested in the conversation goes nowhere, it's never the old stuff. I never let myself be discouraged. I feel as though, like, as we witness the present social and governmental challenges in the last relevant areas around the world, the concept of freedom will be an inevitability that people have to accept. Do you share this sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he was saying that even though often you talk to a statist and it doesn't seem to get anywhere, and um, and he was saying he doesn't lose hope because the you know if you look at how things are going, it seems sort of inevitable that we're gonna we're gonna get there. Um, I have occasionally lost hope, but I <laughs> usually get it back because I think it's absolutely inevitable, 100 percent, that the lie called government is gonna fall exactly like it was inevitable that the lie of a flat earth was going to fall. Because the evidence and the truth and the logic will always be there. No matter how nasty the tyrants get, the truth is going to outlast the lie. Now, when exactly that will happen, I don't know. But it has been speeding up hugely. I, I keep saying this, and it's true, so I'll keep saying it. Ten years ago, I knew maybe six people who dared to call themselves anarchists. Now I know 6,000 at least. It's going fast, and a lot of people are huffing and puffing, but basically most people are sheep. When they see enough people going in that direction, then they'll dare to look and start thinking about it.
Okay. I, I just like to uh, throw out the <coughs> just possibility of you uh, with your with your advocation about us waking up the government. Um, it's like really right on. But I would I would I would implore you to think about government slash corporation. It's actually the same thing, but 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 actually um, but but a lot of people's mindsets are two different things. And so to free ourselves from, from government and to free ourselves from corporation, um, I, you know what I mean? Well, we will really be free. See, you, you know, right. In other words, if we see ourselves just in corporations, we still got Monsanto and all the other things to, to deal with. But to free ourselves, but, but then the government helps Monsanto, and Monsanto helps the government, you know what I mean? So to put that dynamic in, I think, would be more of a full <laughs> Right. He's talking about the tie between corporations and government. And a lot of times, I mean, Hollywood constantly bashes big corporations. Um, what they usually leave off is that the means of big corporations to be nasty is almost always government. Because they can use the state to crush competition and regulate things and say, you're not allowed to you know, milk your own cow and grow your own food and all that lunacy. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a big corporation, if there wasn't a state there, would either be useful or gone very quickly. Because they can't basically... You can't be a mafia if you don't have a government giving you a market to be a mafia in. I mean, what does the mafia control? Drugs, illegal prostitution, illegal gambling, illegal. And the government, you know, the, the, the legal corporations that have a monopoly that the state gave them, it's the same thing. I think they would totally fall apart if they didn't have the thugs of government. And now you have FDA doing, like, SWAT raids on, you know, co-ops. Holy smokes. But that just shows that the thuggery of the corporations is almost always done by way of the state. So if the state falls, the corporations will either start being actually productive or fall apart too. Real quick, isn't anarchists a really strong word? Shouldn't we call ourselves something a little more subtle like voluntarians or something? <laughs> well, I totally understand and I sympathize with the people who want who like to work voluntarist, because that's what it really is. We want to interact voluntarily. Um, the reason I still use the word anarchist is because usually I find that when people figure out what you mean, they go, you're an anarchist? And then I think they sort of feel like they were snuck up on. And so I just start with, yeah, government's bogus, start to finish, top to bottom. I'm an anarchist. And you can freak out, and then we can talk about it. <laughs> so that's, that's my approach. And if other people have different results, that's fine. Thank you very much. Hand for Mark. What a trip. If only we can get him at the Toastmasters. Uh, all right. We are going to take a five minute break. This is not over yet. We're getting down to the final stretch, though. Next up, we're coming up with a solutions roundtable. We're, we're going to get a lot of our speakers back from here. So Larkin's going to be back up. Jim Babb's going to be up. I'm going to be back up. Steve Sheets is going to be up. we got to set up things. So just stand tight. We'll be back in five minutes. Just thank you for coming to the Agora Unconference. And on behalf of Valley Forge, Pete Panam, one of our sponsors, and the rest of our sponsors, thank you for one more time. MCAP Entrepreneur Network, Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Free Keen, Freedom Phoenix, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, We Won't Fly.com.